we love this guy. Let's get right to it. Uh, Bill Bradley, the number one extreme endurance athlete in the world, now calling himself Epic Bill Bradley, please. <laughs> Bill's latest feat, the world's most extreme tri uh, triathlon in Maui, 10-mile open water swim, 300-mile bike ride that included a 10,000-foot climb, a 120-mile run around an island, 75% covered by volcano. Here he is, Epic Bill Bradley. Yeah. The Grand Canyon, you were a battered performer. I was pretty battered at the end of this one, too. Yeah. Six days and 22 and a half hours. I was really battered. Oh, my gosh. Wait, you have one thing. I know you bike, you run, you hike, and snow, etc. Is there one thing that you're special? I hobbled over to a nearby creek and I soaked my feet for about 15 minutes until the swelling came down enough. And then I bummed some tape off a hiker and I taped up my left big toe. I put my shoes and socks up and I started limping up towards the south rim. There was no way I could work on my own feet. I was just, and on top of that, I was on the fourth crossing. I mean, I was wiped out. I was exhausted. I was super overheated. So I asked my crew, I said, I need a volunteer. See these gnarly feet? <laughs> I asked for a volunteer to help me with my feet, right? And it was kind of like one of those comedy movies where all the soldiers are standing in a line and like, will the volunteer please step forward? And everybody steps backwards and there's one sucker left standing there. Well, everybody had an excuse and I don't blame them. But Mar was the person who stayed in place. She did, she not only stayed in place, but she stepped forward. She had told me before we went out here that she had never worked on feet before. Her mom told me later that the sight of blood makes her queasy. And I had feet and I had blood. <laughs> and so, she, but she stepped forward like what a leader has to do. When nobody else will do it, it falls on the leader. That's why the leader's the leader. And so she said, get in the RV and we're going to work on your feet, man. So we would have to do that same routine after each crossing after that. You'd have to work on my feet, tape them up, same the stuff. Man, the man of the hour. Going there he is. World record. World record. <laughs> <laughs> world record. You can't wait to finish this, huh? Uh, can't wait. By the seventh crossing, the start of the seventh crossing, she's out there, got a scalpel in one hand, popping blisters on my feet. She's eating a sandwich in the other hand, and she's telling jokes to James the cameraman. The human spirit will adapt to anything. I had sucked in so much dust by the seventh crossing that I couldn't talk anymore. I could only whisper. I was having difficulty breathing. Mar would pace me for part of the last crossing, the seventh crossing. She'd be four people behind me. She said she could hear me wheezing and gasping for breath all the way back there. And on top of that, I was now hacking up a red mud-like substance. I would later find out I had symptoms of dust Two pneumonia. I was able to run downhill like the downhill specialist that I am. <laughs> that I am. I was like a blur. Yeah. Going down that hill. And then that, the only reason it was a blur is because it was dark. Yeah. <laughs> it had killed numerous settlers in the dust storms of the Midwest in the 1930s. But there was nothing left to do but push through the pain and keep moving forward. But in order to do that, I had to have a stronger why. I couldn't do it for myself anymore. I couldn't do it for leaving a mark. It wasn't enough. I was in too much pain and having too much trouble breathing. So I dedicated the last crossing to my crew. My crew, you see, we had an unspoken agreement. They would give me everything in their power to get to the seven crossings. And I, in return, would do everything in my power to get to those seven crossings. So we'd set that world record and leave our mark. And, and they had done their share. Danny Westergaard, a bad water in Death Valley running legend would pace me for the first crossing. We can go ahead and shift that. Danny, Danny has, he's got the, he had run numerous times across Death Valley. So he would pace me for the first crossing. The Cliffster, our RV driver, 
had driven 2,200 miles to meet us at the top of each crossing. The equivalent of three quarters of the way across the United States. I told you that canyon is huge. And it was critical that he was there when we arrived. Because at night, the temperature was 39 degrees and we were exhausted and dressed for heat. Boom, surround yourself with really great people. The cliffster was like the mailman. He was always there. James, our cameraman, he had paced me for the hottest crossing of the event, 114 degrees. He's not even an ultra runner. Mar would tell me when he finished that crossing, he would sleep for 12 straight hours to recover. Johnny, Johnny had faced his fear of heights for me. He had shared the last of his water with me, risking death or worse. Giardia. Marco Pitts, our crew chief, our fearless leader. She had not only worked on my feet when nobody else wanted to do it, where we would have been out of the race for sure if nobody stepped up and worked out on my worked on my feet. But she had also really had amazing leadership qualities. She had our crew. I never heard one complaint the whole time. And I'm telling you, everybody's overtired. The Pacers are going through extreme heat out there. Not one complaint. Her leadership ability, she kept them focused on our goal of seven crossings. They weren't thinking about themselves at all, just making the seventh crossings. You could see why my crew had done their share. And so I told myself when I started the seventh crossing, I will crawl this crossing if I have to for my crew. Now I want to take a moment here for a quick lesson. Now, if you have a goal you believe in, a goal you believe in really strongly, and you have a why, a why that you would march to hell for, a why you would march to hell for, and you surround yourself with a crew or a team that believes in your goal as much as you do, and, the, and their why to do it is as strong as yours, and they would march to hell with you, then anything, and I mean anything, is possible, even conquering the Grand Canyon. Now, what's next, Bill? Uh, I'm going back to northern Minnesota, which I've tried four times. It's called the Arrowhead 135. You went 135 miles pulling a sled, a 40-pound sled with your survival gear. Mm. Four times I've, I've had frostbite and uh, hypothermia in lots of different ways. I've almost been. All right, Bill, you know I'm your number one.